Welcome to the April 2021 Plant Lovers Tour at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum at NC State. I'm Douglas Roran, the uh, gardens manager here. Uh, the topic today is early blooming herbaceous perennials. Uh, we might stop occasionally and look at a woody perennial like this silver bell tree, but mostly we're going to focus on the uh, herbaceous perennials that are blooming now. I'm going to start right here with this uh, native wildflower. This is um, ragged robin or daisy fleabane. It's, um, you, you see it does look a lot like a daisy um, and it is in that same family, the big aster or composite family. Um, it's um, Arigaron pulchellus. Pulchellus is a Latin word or Greek word that's uh, worth remembering because it means pretty. Um, it, it, here it's in sun all afternoon. It also grow in um, light shade. It blooms for six or eight weeks. And um, it's, the foliage is also evergreen, so it doesn't disappear in the winter. So it's really a wonderful small scale flowering ground cover. Um, and being a, in the aster family, it also feeds a lot of pollinators. Um, uh, we're talking about flowering perennials, but I think this time of year, the new foliage on hostas is about as pretty as it is all summer long. We'll jump over here um, and talk about a, cu a couple different ajugas. Um, this is a, an ajuga that's been around for a long time under various names. I knew it for a long time as uh, ajuga reptans metallica crispa. The leaf is, um, and it's not, it's not the time of year to really notice the foliage because it's covered with flowers, but the leaf is densely savoyed, like a savoy cabbage or some types of spinach. And when the foliage is mature, it's very hard. It's like a almost rigid plastic. It's really fun. It also seems to be one that's um, a little bit um, more rot resistant through the summer months. Um, than a, a lot of uh, other ajugas. Um, ajugas in the mint family, that huge family with so many so many plants and generally deer leave that fam family alone. So it is a little ground cover you can grow in shade or part sun, um, even if you deal with deer. Um, few steps on is another selection of ajuga, one called chocolate chip. It has a tiny little a very dark leaf. Um, and there's some very exciting new ajugas available. One of them is a sport, a mutation of chocolate chip that has a bright yellow leaf. It's, you know, I've known the, uh, things like this ajuga metallica crispus for, for a very long time, but it's the first time I've ever seen ajugas with a bright yellow foliage. So that's pretty exciting. Take a few steps up here. The uh, genus Phlox is a large genus, uh, almost all of them North American natives. And the name Phlox actually comes from Greek for flame, which always seemed like a strange choice of names for Phlox because the typical color is sort of this Phlox pink. There are some um, highly bred selections of Phlox paniculata and, and um, others that are. Um, reddish, but the most common color in, among uh, is, is this pink color. Um, this is, I'm going to say it's Phlox subulata, but in gardens, um, a lot of the cultivars are probably hybrids between several related species of Phlox. But Phlox subulata has a um, uh, foliage that is very much like a, a ground cover juniper, sort of needly and pokey, but they bloom for, oh, six or eight weeks this time of year. Um, they're highly favored by butterflies and, and bees and stuff. Um, and nowadays, the selections of these early ground cover flocks are, um, you know, come in a wide range of colors. You see there's a little bit of a white one here, um, but there's also blues and a uh, deep reddish pinks that are almost a true red, but not really a true red. Um, 
this type of flocks, there uh, are sun lovers and they're very drought tolerant once they're established. But of course, there are other flocks that bloom this time of year that are woodland flocks like the wild blue flocks or wild blue sweet william. And flock stolonifer is another native flock that um, uh, you know, prefers woodland conditions. Back here, we have a wonderful little Veronica. Veronica is the scientific name of the, this genus, but you like a lot of, a lot of the uh, scientific names of plants, they come from many different sources, like people's names or names from mythology. But uh, Veronica is both its common name. And its so some Veronica are called Speedwell as well. Uh, this is a little Veronica called Water Perry Blue. Um, its name Water Perry comes from a horticulture school in England named Water Perry. Um, we've had this one in the rose garden for, I guess, going on 10 years. And it, it um, blew for an extended period of time and from late winter into spring. And then it's the foliage is evergreen. So it's a good year round um, small cover. Um, there is now a white selection of it, moment called white water. Now, at the Arboretum, we're all about trying plants we haven't grown before. And this is a little potentilla. Uh, the potentillas, some of the potentillas have the common name of sink foil. And um, sink is, you know, if you know Spanish, is uh, like cinco is five and foil is foliage. And a lot of the potentillas have a divided leaf that's divided into five divisions. But um, you see, um, they look a lot like strawberry flowers and they're in that same family in the rose family, that big family. And this was a little potentilla that um, was purchased when the flowering lawn was first planted. And I thought it might turn out to be a weed, but it hasn't been at all. It really hasn't spread beyond where it was planted. The foliage is evergreen and it has these tiny little flowers at this time of year. And it's a Potentilla Newmaniana. I'm sure named after somebody with the family name of Newman. Okay. This is the uh, white sport of Veronica water peri blue. Um, that I mentioned a moment ago, this is white water. Uh, seems to have the same uh, strong constitution, um, but in this lovely um, pure white. We're going to do a little bit of traveling now. We're gonna go through the scree garden and up onto the roof of the building for some other early blooming perennials. Well, Stop here a moment and look at another native wildflower that's one you can grow in your garden. This is a, a little bird's foot violet. It's a true violet. The leaves are highly dissected and that's where you get the um, common name of bird's foot. Um, and this is, uh, in the wild, they can be either bicolor like this or solid, uh, uh, blue violet color, but um, it's Viola pedata. And you see, it does look a, a bit like a pansy, but pansies are also in the genus Viola. Um, it's a sun lover. A lot of violets prefer shade, but this, the bird's foot violet is definitely a um, sun lover and uh, probably wouldn't stand a lot of competition in a garden. But if you have a place where it can grow and not be beat up by more robust neighbors. It's a charming little native wildflower. We saw some pink and white phlox subulata down below. This is um, another creeping phlox. This is one called emerald or emerald blue. Um, emerald might seem like an odd name for this pale bluish colored one, but the foliage is a bright emerald green. It's a vigorous grower. And um, I mentioned that the creeping flocks in gardens are um, probably hybrids between uh, similar, closely related species. And one of them is flocks bifida, meaning bi, meaning two, and uh, FID, 
referring to a, you know, a notch or something. And you can see these flowers, the petals have a strong notch um, at the end of each petal. Um, over here, we have a couple of um, yellow daisy-like plants. Um, this is a uh, Tetranurus, um, the Julieta daisy. It's a, a upper Midwest, um, you know, Rocky Mountain native. And it has a, a flowers through uh, most of the year. It started blooming probably about January and it'll go pretty strong through spring and then sort of spit and sputter all summer. It's, um, you know, just a low tuft of foliage with these rather large flowers for a little plant. That's tetra, nor, tetra nervous, uh, tetra norris, referring to uh, four veins in the leaves. Um, mid spring, some of the spring bulbs are still going strong. This is a, a little Narcissus jonquilla hybrid called Chit Chat. Um, it, you know, a lot of these little narcissus just get better year after year unless they get super crowded and then you divide them and build back their strength. Um, but the little jonquil um, narcissus get their name jonquil because the foliage is very narrow, like uh, the common rush, juncus. And uh, they'll, they're thriving up here in this very lean soil, but they'll also tolerate, um, you know, a more normal clay soil just get better every year. And they're usually very fragrant, but they're the, you know, you'd buy the bulbs in the fall and um, um, plant them then. There are um, some tulips that are perennial. And I might just add that um, the topic is early blooming perennials. And some, I know somebody in the audience, if I could hear you all is probably saying, these are bulbs, they're not perennials. Well, Bulbs are herbaceous perennials. They just happen to die away to a storage organ underground. Uh, this is a tulipa. I'll show you the label, um, Linifolia batalinii. Now, if you go into a, a bulb catalog, they're not going to use Linifolia. They're just going to have tulipa um, batalinii. But the batalinii are a subdivision of the species Linifolia. And again, they're growing in this very lean soil up on the roof, but this is actually a little species tulip that will grow in average garden soil and just get better year after year. Um, it comes in a um, range of colors. This particular one is called Hunky Tonk. Um, there's a bit of a reddish blush to the outside of the tepals, um, but others are solid yellow or bright red but it's a great little tulip. Now there are some tulips up here, like uh, Tulipa humilis um, and some other species tulip that are hard to grow in average soil, but um, in this very lean soil, they're actually pretty good. Um, yeah, we'll turn around and meet another tulip over here. This is um, the little peppermint stick tulip. Tulipa clusiana, um, the typical, this is the typical Tulipa clusiana with the um, red outside to the tepals and the white inner tepals. Um, there's another subspecies, subspecies chrysantha, meaning golden flower, where instead of, where this one is white, it's bright yellow. But uh, Tulipa clusiana, in average garden soil it tends to last forever and just get better. And in some gardens even so seed around and naturalize. Now I'm using the term teepal instead of petal because in some flowering plants, the uh, uh, sepals are petal-like. And in that case, teepal is used to mean that there's not a clear distinction between petals and sepals. In a tulip in, that, in the lily family, where there are um, six tepals, the outer the outer one are the technically the sepals, and the inner ones are the true petals. But since they're all 
pedal-like, we use the term sepals. I mean, Lord, tepals. We have a, a number of different species of this anemone relic. I think um, these were in the genus anemone. They were anemone pulsatilla, but now they're in their own genus, the genus uh, pulsatilla. And there's related species. Uh, this is pulsatilla patens, and um, they're thriving in this very lean soil. And this one is a fairly somber, uh, but some of them are really uh, uh, burgundy or, or, or um, in the it's like hellebores and anemones look much like that. The, this foliage is very fuzzy, very softly fuzzy, but it's a herbaceous perennial that um, disappears for a while over winter and then comes back up early and is, is blooming now. Um, I think most of these were probably raised from seed. You can get fine seed from some of the uh, specialist plant societies, but um, these two have made really thick clumps over the years. Technically, uh, rosemary is, is not a herbaceous perennial, it's a shrub or subshrub, but uh, this particular cultivar has really beautiful bluish flowers for many months starting in late winter. It's um, a cultivar that's sold under its trademark name of Irene, but the real cultivar is Renzel's. Um, and it has sort of an arching, almost weeping growth habit. And it, it, this is the uh, same rosemary you'd use in the kitchen. And taxonomists have recently decided that uh, the genus rosemary should be merged with salvia. So it'll retain rosemary as its common name, but the genus will no longer be rosemarinus, but uh, it'll be a salvia. This is uh, Tulipa humulus, a very double form. Normally it would just have six tepals like a everyday tulip, but this is a cultivar named Samantha with very double flowers. And this is a species tulip that would be hard to grow in uh, you know regular clay soil, but up in this very lean soil. Um, some of these beds are just um, permatil and um, and we are up on the roof of the building, um, but in that very lean soil, um, they do quite well, and they also get a good summer baking. A lot of the a lot of bulbs are native to drier parts of the Middle East, so they're used to a very very dry um, summer. And uh, if they have a wet summer on heavy soil, the bulbs usually rot. Um, cactus aren't herbaceous; they're um, they're, well, they're not herbaceous. Uh, you know, the body of the cactus is a stem that lives from year to year, but I'm just gonna point out this one. You can see all the big buds. They'll probably be in bloom in another, you no, know, probably by early May or so. This is um, Notocactus apricus, apricus, has large yellow flowers and is a reliably winter hardy cactus in this, in this area. We've added quite a few uh, cactus to the roof garden. We look forward to their uh, bloom this spring and summer. And we'll head over to the crevice garden and the dwarf conifer garden. Yeah, this is a, um, um, well, this is a, the crevice garden and it's for, plants that really have to have very, very sharp drainage. The stone is set on edge. The uh, medium is just gravel and sand, I think for the most part. And some of the plants that wouldn't survive in regular soil thrive here. But this is just a real curious, super tiny selection of flock subulated, the same creeping flocks we saw several times uh, this afternoon. One named Herbert, just tiny little flowers, everything about the plant is miniature.
this is the tetraneurus that we saw a little while ago. I can hold the label up so you can see the name. Um, and we don't, you know, when we think of the coal family, the cabbage and mustard green family, we don't think of garden ornamentals, but the other name for, for that family is the uh, cruciferate is the old name for that family. Um, and that's referring to a cross because all members of that family have a four petaled flower. Now that's tiny. I don't know if you can see it, um, but there's four petals and they form a cross. So that's why the family is the cruciferate, the name meaning to bear crosses. And this is a tiny little ornamental. Um, the genus is um, Ethio Ethionema. Um, and it's also fragrant, but it's a short lived uh, herbaceous perennial, but we tend to always have it in the garden because it seeds around in a mild way. But um, the ice plants, the delospermas are really valuable small scale ground covers for sunny, well-drained spots. Um, most of them are, are not yet blooming, but this is a, a species that's much earlier blooming. This is um, Delosperma sutherlandii, again, named after somebody with the family name of Sutherland. Um, and it's not much of a spreader. This is several plants and, you know, over several years, it's only spread this far, but it has some of the largest flowers that I've seen on an ice plant. Um, you know, it's not, the, the ice plants are generally not easy, are not difficult to grow. Um, they just want a sunny spot with average drainage. We met a member of the uh, cruciferae a moment ago, the little Ethionema, but this is one of the wallflowers, which you see also has a four petaled flower and is, gives away the fact that it's in that same family. A lot of wallflowers are real fragrant. This one is just starting and I didn't get any fragrance from it, but it's a little one we grew from seed. What is that little guy? Oh, th this is a little gypsophila. Um, baby's breath is uh, a gypsophila. The name gypsophila means uh, gypsum loving. It's a lime loving plant, but this is a tiny little rock garden sized uh, baby's breath. Okay. Oh. And yet another um, species phlox that's related to the other ones we saw earlier today. This is phlox um, nivalis, nivalis referring to snow. Um, Though white is not the typical color of that species, I think it refers to the very early blooming habit of the plant. And this is one that uh, Tim Alderton, the Arboretum horticulturist, collected a few cuttings from a roadside plant somewhere in this area. Um, you know, it comes in that white or pink. Okay. Um, Oh, this beautiful little rock garden, its main feature are dwarf conifers. Um, and, you know, like this tiny little pine, um, this pine was planted in 2017 and was, you know, maybe half the size in 2017, but it's still only about six inches tall. And there's a number of other small conifers in here, but of course, in time, even the, these real small conifers will get bigger. And in the, in the meantime, we've infilled in between them with um, tiny little herbaceous perennials. And this is another mustard family member. This is essentially a candy tuft. This isn't the common candy tuft, but, um, an, an, and the candy tuft are in the genus Iberis. Um, and this is Iberis, um, oh, I renewed the name a moment ago. 
Um, but it's one that we started off with a few plants probably in 2017 or 18, and they tend to flower themselves to death this time of year, but then they replace themselves with uh, a generous number of seedlings. We usually have to thin them out, but then they're, they're bloom for almost two months this time of year and then uh, exit the stage. But yeah, we do have on this side a tiny little iris with a few flowers still left. Oh, they've faded since this morning when I looked. Oh no, there we go. I just had to fluff it a bit. Um, a little iris native to uh, China, Iris Henrii. I'm guessing named for um, Ernest China Wilson. Um, uh, I know I am messed it up. Henry was another plant collector in China, but it, it's past its peak of bloom, but it is a tiny little thing. We had a, a slight bit of frost uh, this past weekend. And um, this is Oxalis regnet, regnetii, and uh, a little bit of brown foliage is a result of that frost, but the Oxalis regnetii start early. Um, and this is just the, a green leaf of it, but they'll flower on and off all through the growing season probably better known nowadays are the um, purple leaf forms. Um, and th there's a bunch of different variations on these, you know, purple leaf with white flowers, purple leaf with lavender flowers, but they're, they're real easy um, garden perennials. Um, they're actually maybe slightly better in a light, a bright shaded garden than out in full sun, but here their neighbors get a lot bigger and provide quite a bit of shade through um, the hottest part of the summer. Okay. Um, this is Allium triquetrum, tri referring to uh, three. Um, triquetrum, I don't know, um, maybe referring to like a three corner hat or something. The genus Allium is really large. It includes a number of really important edible plants like onion and garlic. You know, you can hardly cook without using onion and garlic, but there are a number of um, species that are grown as ornamentals. And of the many alliums that are sold as bulbs, along with the daffodils and tulips every fall, um, many of them are not persistent in our gardens, but Allium triquetrum is one that I think is really worthwhile because it blooms for almost two months, it gets better every year. It, it continues to bloom well, even when it gets crowded. And um, here it, it has sun most of the day, but it, it's also really good in a, a shaded garden that's not too terribly dark. Um, but it's just a wonderful little bulb. Um, and I've never known it to get weedy, but um, maybe if you accidentally spread the bulbs around, um, come up here and there but you know again something that used to be in the lily family with uh, six tepals uh, the, uh, the stem is um, three-angled so maybe that's what the tri is uh, referring to very strongly three-angled now obviously I'm not standing in front of a herbaceous perennial but a, a woody perennial a, a small tree this is a uh, magnolia lavifolia. Um, this is actually a cultivar named Michelle, named by Tony Avent for his first wife, Michelle. And um, it's in that part of the genus Magnolia that used to be in its own genus. Um, um, oh, I'm drawing, what are the banana shrubs? Yeah, Michelle or Michelia. Um, banana shrub used to be in the genus Michelia, and now they're all lumped into Magnolia, but um, it's just sort of this um, cascade of white flowers, a, a slight fragrance. Um, there are many selections of Lavifolia. The one that has um, 
been the most reliably cold hardy for us is one called um, Gail's Favorite or Gail's Choice. Um, that one came through the cold winters that cut back some of the other selections of Magnolia labifolia. Hold up the label so you, oops. Magnolia labifolia, Michelle. And we met uh, the peppermint stick tulip a moment ago, um, tulip occlusiana. Um, if you take the white form, white and red form of tulip occlusiana and the bright yellow and red form of clusiana, that's variety chrysantha and cross them, you come up with this intermediate one, um, which is um, usually sold as the cultivar Cynthia, but the same, um, you know, long, um, you know, permanent habit in the garden, just getting better every year. The uh, genus Iris is huge. Um, this is close to what is often called the bearded iris. And the beard comes from this fuzzy caterpillar-like structure here, which is the part of the plant that accepts the pollen. Um, but this is not a, a straight bearded iris. This is a aral hybrid, aral bred. Now the, the common bearded irises are crossed with aral iris and the aral iris, irises are, are a number of different species of, of iris that are native to parts of the um, Middle East that have very, very dry summers. And because um, they're not tolerant of, of moisture in the summer, the aral iris are very hard to grow in our climate. But by crossing the aral iris with the bearded iris, and coming up with these hybrids, some of them are much easier to grow than others. And this cultivar, Walker Ross, has been here for quite a long time and um, blooms real nicely every, every year at this time. Um, but it's very much the start of the bearded iris season, starting off with the smaller ones, and we'll see an example in a moment. The uh, aral hybrids often um, have a, a big, round spot of color on the falls of the iris. Yeah, this has a bit of that bearded iris smell. Um, we'll see more iris in a moment, but since we're passing by this uh, little cat mint, this nepeda, I thought I'd mention this one. This is um, a one named uh, early bird. It's the earliest of the nepedas that I know. And all of the nepetas uh, of this type are really worth growing. Um, you know, this one will be going past its peak and um, another selection will start. And um, most of the later selections are a lot, low, a lot taller growing than this. But the beautiful blue-violet uh, flowers for many months. And uh, it's a plant that's really enjoyed by the bumblebees. Um, and again, you know, Nepeta is in the mint family with Ajuga, the lavender, and um, the rosemary we saw on the roof. And um, so generally not bothered here. I hear someone in the audience saying, they eat it in my garden. Okay. And there goes a bunny rabbit. The, um, here's an example of a Oh, I guess this might be a bordered bearded iris. There's many classes of, of bearded irises. And, you know, there's uh, dwarf bearded iris, miniature dwarf bearded iris, bordered bearded, um, miniature bordered iris, um, intermediate bearded iris, and, and standard bearded iris. Uh, you know, I'm sure I messed up those classes, but this is a uh, Really nice one, uh, where is its label? Um, well, anyhow, I, if you need the name on this one, just contact me and I'll get it uh, for you. But it's, it's a really nice early blooming one. 
Tim would know immediately, but he's not at hand right now. What's that? What's the bed number? NBP. MB? Yeah, that's New Border P. Oh, okay. It's right past L17, which is um, Laugh House 17. Okay. And I, I might as well mention the, oh, my goodness. Did our agapanthus get hit by the frost this past weekend? My goodness, that's disappointing. Tim and I both really want to have nice agapanthus displays. Maybe it won't set them back too, too hard. But um, the poppy or florist anemone, anemone uh, coronaria, um, are, are bought in the fall. You soak the the tubers overnight, you plant them, and they give you a display similar to tulips, but where it's a tulip flower or a tulip bulb usually makes one flower. These produce a long, long succession of flowers. Um, you know, this clump, there's some flowers that are spent, there's some that are at their prime, there's more that are still coming up. Um, so even though if you, if uh, they generally don't come back the following year that you really get almost two months of bloom out of them. So I think they're really worthwhile. Now, it's my suspicion that if you dug up the tubers when the plants are going dormant, you know, another month or two, and just stored them bone dry inside or just anywhere, um, and then replanted them in the fall, I think they you could keep them going indefinitely. Because again, the, this, like so many spring flowering bulbs, they're of Mediterranean origin. So if you give them that solid dry summer rest, um, they'll be just fine. They probably rot in wet spells in the summers, my guess. We did plant some of these up on the roof where the soil is extremely well drained, thinking that, well, maybe there they would um, survive the summer. But time will tell. Oh, and I see our, our first plant of flamethrower, the, um, the red bud, the Circus canadensis flamethrower bred by NC State's red bud breeder, Dr. Denny Werner, is starting to leaf out. You see, it, it's not the burgundy of so many um, red buds, but this sort of flame red color. Um, and as the leaves age, they, they go from this flame color to orange to yellow. And so at, at one point, you have three or four colors on the plant at, at the same time. So it's really a, a very distinct red bud for its foliage color. And it's, um, we're really looking forward to this young plant uh, taking off this year. It was planted about a year ago. So with a year's worth of new ro root growth underground, we're expecting it to really take off this year. Okay. Um, we're going to cover just a few uh, herbaceous perennials that are blooming now that would be good additions to the shade garden. The genus Epimedium um, is a large one, and they can vary from either being plants that are evergreens that have beautiful foliage year round to deciduous ones that disappear into fall to, to ones that are clump formers that are, you know, always sort of stay put to ones that spread and are make for a really good ground cover. Um, they're all Asian, or I guess, well, most of them are Asian in origin. I guess some of them are uh, European. But this is a Chinese species, Epimedium Wushan ents from Wushan. And um, it's a large growing one. And it's largely evergreen. The old foliage has been cut away it's because by time it starts to bloom again, last year's foliage is kind of tattered. Right now, these leaves are soft, but when they mature, they're really tough. And this has also been a epimedium that um, has really done well wherever we plunk it down in the arboretum. Um, there are several epimediums in the plant cell. One of them is Sandy Claws, which has a similar really tough leaf with almost a sawtooth edge to the leaf. Um, and this is a volunteer seedling that we think is probably one and another species that's in the Arboretum, but just sort of a constellation of little 
starry flower. Primula ciboldii, or oh, I think, or is it ciboldiana? It looks like somebody stepped on it, probably trying to get the perfect photograph. Um, it's a little woodland Asian primrose. Um, it's real easy to grow. Probably it's, it's harder to find than it is to grow. And it has an interesting life cycle. It's dormant in the summer, so it completely disappears by oh, midsummer and then returns each spring. The petals you can see are very, have a real pretty fringed edge to them. Um, white and various shades of pink are the typical colors. Some are sort of bicolors. Uh, has this pretty sort of scalloped edge leaf. And just around the corner, we have a related species, Primula kisoena, which has a broader, very, very hairy leaf, but um, it's, that one is the white form of Kisuena, um, but its typical color is sort of purple pink. This is one of those plants with uh, occasionally striped flowers. See, a lot of flowers are pure white, but a lot of them um, have some pink stripes. And um, it's like the striped camellias have what um, people have described as a stutter gene. So sometimes you'll get a branch where the flowers are solid pink or red, and it's a rhododendron huang 1-3-16, um, probably waiting for a new name. Um, but it, it's a lovely thing, and there's a few of those in the plant sale. Yeah. Um, which primula? Uh, it's primula ciboldii. I might be wrong, it might be Sebaldianum, but it's Primula Sebaldii, okay? And, well, this one will have a label for us, I think, yeah. Yeah, it's Sebaldii. And just another example of, of Primula Sebaldii, and see, the name is Sebaldii, not Sebaldiana, but this is a cultivar called Drag Queen, very, uh, you know, sort of white centered flowers getting darker to, to, towards the edge with a nice fringe edge. Um, they're just as easy as can be. Um, someone wants to grow a worthwhile crop to, for a nursery, I think that'd be a good group to work with. I'm gonna talk about some plants, but I will also answer questions. What? I can... Um, I can hear the questions so people can unmute themselves and ask the questions out loud if they would like. Uh, I don't know how well Chris can read the chat and I can't read the chat while I talk. Uh, Chris says he, he might be able to read them, so he, he'd be okay. So uh, if we have questions, first off, I'll answer those. I'm gonna talk about our plant sale. This is uh, our online plant sale. You can go to our website and you can see the catalog on the, on the website. Uh, we are not shipping plants, so they have to be picked up here locally. Uh, and there's a sign up after your order for, for picking up the plants. Um, this is, right now it's only open for members. So you have to be a member to, to order right now. Uh, but we will open it up to the public in a week be warned some plants sell out uh we already have some that have have sold out but um and i'm going to talk about some that we we still have uh, pretty good numbers on uh, so any questions about the sale in general before i start or if uh anything along those lines all right chris How about says the website no. will that be posted pardon okay i see website is the website jcra.ncsu.edu. Okay. And you can see the information about the plant sale right there. And you can see the list there. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk about a few plants uh, to get going. And I'm happy to answer questions about any of these I talk about or, or others. So this is a plant we've, we've talked about before on, on tours. This is a magnolia called Serendipity. Uh, Doug, I believe earlier in the tour, talked a little bit about some evergreen 
magnolias, um, Michelle. This is uh, a hybrid with that same species, Magnolia lavifolia. It's a beautiful evergreen plant. You can see even these little one gallon plants have nice fat flower buds on them. And right now we're talking in the shade of a great big plant. I don't know how well we'll be able to focus in on that, but you can see it is just loaded with blooms. And what's great about this plant, Magnolia serendipity, is the flowers start to open kind of farther back and continue and continue and continue. So if you get a freeze, you can lose a lot of flowers, but there still be flowers that are tightly um, in bud that will open up later on. So even, you know, this usually is starting in uh, very early April for us. Um, so, so it can, it can get, take some damage sometimes with a late freeze, but we'll keep going. It is a pretty good sized plant. It's, um, big and, and round. It's been a vigorous grower. It, we just think the world of this thing and it's, it's nicely fragrant, not overpowering, but, but really nice. And, um, it's been, it's sailed through our winters with no problem at all. Any, any questions or anything I didn't, um, and talk about this grows sun to light shade. Boxwoods. Um, you know, if you're going to grow a plant, a green plant that doesn't have showy flowers, you might as well grow boxwood, right? And if you're going to grow a boxwood, you ought to grow uh, an interesting one. Uh, this, we've got two in the, in the program right now. Uh, maybe adding a third. I think there's a third one coming in. I think we might have a variegated one that we're going to have. This is one, and you notice these tags. This was in, in, on the uh, magnolia uh, that I just showed as well. These are choice plants. This is a program that a promotions program we have with uh, some nurseries, some, some plants that we really think are superior plants here from the Arboretum that, that they help sell. And uh, it's got information from the Arboretum on there. This is one called Unraveled. It's, it's been in the trade for a little while now. It's really one that we helped get, uh, uh, help popularize, get it out. And it is a weeping boxwood. Now there are some old weeping boxwoods that the branches go out and kind of drip over at the tip. This thing is weeping. You can grow it over a wall and it'll cascade down and it's a vigorous grower. So often when they're grown, they're just kind of, uh, you know, in a mound in the pot, but these that we're selling are nice big ones that have been staked up. So you can continue staking this up and it'll keep cascading down and make this really elegant, elegant, um, plant. You can either leave it kind of cascading all the way down or as it grows, you could limit up a little bit. So it becomes like a little evergreen weeping tree. It'd be great for in containers because it's drought tolerant. And boxwoods are just incredibly underutilized uh, for their um, shade tolerance. People think of them as full sun plants, but boxwoods actually grow in woodland areas where they're native and they, they like being in some shade. They, they grow really, uh, really nice. Now, when we want the little tight round, you know, meatballs, those, uh, you know, in more shade, they'll be a little bit looser and open. And sometimes people don't like that. But when you're talking about a weeping plant like this, that's perfect for it. So I think it's really underutilized for a dry shade area. Now we have another one, and this one's brand new. Uh, this is one called Buxus flattery. Um, and we have not grown this yet, so this is new for us as well. But this will grow kind of as a pancake and grow wider, um, not grow very tall and, and grow uh, wide. Um, nice small plant, which is what I like to plant um, because it's, it's easy to do. And again, I grow my boxwoods in my woodland, uh, so I can plant this right underneath a big tree. I don't have to dig a big hole under that tree. And it um, is really uh, quite shade and drought tolerant uh, once it's in there. But you can grow it out in full, full sun. You can grow these kind of as a, a woody ground cover. You can grow as an individual plant. Um, but I think it's pretty cool. Uh, like I said, we haven't grown this yet. So this is a very new, new, new plant. All right, and y'all feel free to chip in with questions anytime. Uh, Chris will let me know. 
Okay. Another great plant. Now this is a larger one. I don't know if you can see that. Do I, should I back up for you? I think we're good. Okay. This is a uh, Parodia Persica, uh, the Persian ironwood. And this is one called Persian spire, a very upright uh, one form with, with kind of a tight, narrow habit. Parodias are really interesting plants. Uh, these as it go, you get from the name Parodia persica, comes from the Middle East kind of region, uh, Asia Minor. And the, the foliage on many of them, including this uh, selection, will come out with this kind of burgundy reddish uh, rim to the leaf, which is really, I think, quite attractive. Uh, in the fall, Parodias off, usually get very, very good fall color. They're related to witch hazels and get those same kind of intense maroons and oranges and reds uh, that can be really quite beautiful. Uh, in winter, as they get older, you get some really nice bark. It, feel, it, it peels off and exfoliates into kind of jigsaw patterns and really is beautiful. Uh, I, it's just not a tree that's widely known, but it is it is a gorgeous plant. Usually it grows kind of as a multi-stem tree and gets very as wide as it gets tall. But this uh, Persian spire is real upright, uh, fastidious kind of plant. Now it's not gonna stay as a narrow column. It'll get a little bit wider, but the branches will go up. So you won't have it being, you know, 30 feet wide and 30 feet tall. Uh, flowers are not super showy, but during the winter, before the leaves come out, you'll get these little um, deep kind of crimson red flowers uh, with no petals, but lots of little stamens on there. So they're interesting up close, but they're not going to, you're not going to stop your car if you're going 55 miles an hour when you see this in flower. So, and these are nice seven gallons. We don't have anything in the sale bigger than a seven gallon container because we don't like moving great big plants around. Any questions about Parodia? Growing conditions? Growing conditions. Great. Yeah, it is a tough plant. Um, typically you see it growing in full sun, but uh, it'll grow in shade just fine. You know, you're not growing it for its flowers. So if it doesn't flower well in the shade, that's that's not a problem. Uh, it'll be a little bit slower, a little more open. But uh, but yeah, I've got this this one Persian spire planted in my woodland garden at home, and it's it's doing great. And it's um, once it's established, parodias are very very drought tolerant. All right, I'm gonna squat down a little bit here rather than picking these up. We have got a great selection of peonies. Uh, quite a few different ones in the, the sale from super old classics like Festiva Maxima, which is just, just kind of the most rock solid uh, peony you can, you, can, you can do. It's, it's a nice double white with some red flecks in the flower. And it's been grown since I think the 1700s. Um, to, with those to brand brand new ones uh, like Eden's Peony, which is a really a nice uh, Eden's Perfume, which is a really nice double pink, super fragrant one. Lady Orchid, which is kind of a lavender pink uh, double. And these are, I mean, these have bud, flower buds on them. They're going to flower this year. Um, this is uh, one. Let me see if it's the one I think it is. We got a whole bunch. Yeah, this is one called, God, I hate even saying this, Scrum Diddlyumptious, which ugh, people who name these plants. Um, but this is one of the Edo hybrid uh, peonies. The Edo hybrids named for a breeder who actually never saw his, his first hybrid uh, bloom, but he hybridized uh, the, the herbaceous peonies with the tree peonies. Um, herbaceous peonies are, are really easy to grow, um, great garden plants, long-lived. Tree peonies, if they're in the right conditions, can be long-lived and easy, but they, they can be a little bit trickier. The hybrids between the two really uh, give the best of both worlds. Um, they are easy to grow. They are tough as nails. Um, you can see down here, perhaps, 
uh, it's got some kind of semi woody stems. So these stems, as they age, will get, get almost woody. And so they don't flop over like other peonies do. Um, and after it finishes flowering, it looks great all season. And then in the fall, you, you cut it back a little bit to some buds. But when it's in flower, now this one's kind of a creamy yellow double, um, but the Edo peonies just are flowering machines, great big flowers. And every year they will get better and better. I planted uh, my first Edo uh, peony uh, about three years ago. And the first year it was like this, it didn't have any flower buds. Second year I had about 10 great big, you know, navel orange size uh, yellow flowers on it. Second year I had about uh, 35. Uh, this year I was going out and just counting buds and I can't even see all the buds on there. They haven't all, all really emerged yet, but I'm probably have a hundred plus buds on it uh, in three years. I mean, they are just amazing. Now they're expensive uh, because it's very slow to propagate them and, and peonies in general, especially the newer ones. It, it's, it's, it takes a lot to propagate them. Um, they take a lot of space to grow. Uh, when you're selling flowering size plants like this, that means they've, they've been in production for several years. So they tend to be a little on the pricey side, especially these Edo peonies, but they are so worth it. And uh, once it's there, it, it, you got it forever. Grow it in sun. They, they want sun, but oh man, they are just tough, tough plants. And Mark, we had a couple questions in the chat, which I don't think we need to repeat because I am mic mic'd. Okay. Joyce would like to know if they grow nicely in pots. Do they grow nicely in pots? Uh, yes. You want to provide. So this is this is where it gets tricky in pots. You need very good drainage during the winter. They don't want to rot uh, the rotten winter if it stays too wet. Um, so, but they need adequate moisture during the summer while they're growing. If they really stress, that'll affect uh, the flower set for the following year just because it won't have as much energy. So if you can make sure they stay uh, fairly well watered over the su summer uh, and then make sure they're not staying too wet, like this past winter when it just rained and rained and rained, uh, that probably would have, would have been an issue for them in containers. But if you, you could just throw a board over the container over the winter and, and keep it from being too wet. Okay. And Annabelle would like to know if the Edos stay woody all winter. Um, no, I cut my Edos down really close to the ground. Um, so in the fall, you'll see those, the stems will be there. And as you go look down the stems, kind of the top, two thirds will be mostly herbaceous and will kind of, uh, you know, die back in the winter. And then below that, you'll have kind of woody stems and you'll have some nice big fat buds on there. And then you'll get up and there'll be a little bit smaller buds. I usually cut back until there's one or two buds there, but I know other people who cut them back, you know, just back two inches, three inches to the ground um, and they're fine. So you don't have those kind of scraggly uh, branches that you get from a, uh, 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 tree peony. And the final question is from Diane about peonies, and she would like to know how you support them. Oh, I plant other things nearby them. I don't, I, I don't put peony supports out. I don't do any of that kind of thing. Uh, I plant them and then I put, you know, I have other things growing close by and they grow up through there and are kind of supported by the other plants that are around them. Um, the Edo peonies, peonies, you don't have to worry about that anyway. And that's it for the questions in chat. All right. So I was talking about some new plants with the Edo peonies. Let me talk about a plant that's been around for a long time that everybody seems to love, but I rarely see it in people's gardens. This is uh, Poncyris trifoliata, or sometimes now Citrus trifoliata. The, um, trifoliate orange or hardy orange you can see it's got trifoliate leaves three little leaflets on there right now you know bare stems white flowers and these do have an, kind of an orange blossom fragrance it is a true citrus plant so like your oranges lemons limes except for this is super hardy 
these um and this is one called flying dragon which has kind of these twisted contorted stems and these kind of twisted uh uh thorns on there and now you can grow it as a multi-stem shrub kind of how it started right here you can also over time as it grows you can limit up a little bit and grow it into more of a tree our big one is more of a, a tree than a, a, a shrub and so in the spring before the leaves you get these white um, fragrant flowers it's doesn't cover itself with flowers it's not like a, a flowering cherry or something but then it'll leaf out with these leaves. It's really beautiful all summer long. Nothing bothers it. Uh, this family, Rutaceae, uh, tends not to have a lot of uh, insect problems. And then in later summer into fall, it'll form kind of a maybe golf ball size uh, orange fruits. And it'll be covered in orange fruits. They're really beautiful. So as the leaves drop, you get these green stems and you have these orange fruits on there. And it's uh, it's a real a real showy thing. Um, you know, people always ask if they're edible and of course they're edible. Um, it is a citrus. It's just, they tend to be bitter. Um, people say you can make marmalade out of them. Uh, I say you can make, you can use them for whiskey sours, uh, maybe to uh, garnish a margarita or something like that. Um, but it's just, it's a great plant. And we were, uh, somebody said when they were unloading the plant, um, Doug told me that the the driver uh, said that um, wherever we're somewhere he goes by the loading docks or by the trash cans or something where they have bear problems, they plant these out because it's, it's vicious. I mean, it will, it will grab you and not let go. So you got to be careful where you plant it, but it is hardy. I grew this. I was introduced to it in um, Blacksburg, Virginia at Virginia mm. tech, you know, a, a cold zone six garden and they had a plant and, every five or six years it would get hit pretty hard and knock it back hard but it would it would come back um so real easy grow it in, in sun for best uh fruiting and flowering questions on that one no questions all right uh, let me talk about these guys because these are great i've got too many plants to talk about all of them but i'm going to try and talk about some so the biggest problem everybody has, what's everybody's big problem? It's deer, right? Deer, deer, deer. So Elysium. Elysium are plants that deer do not eat. I, I have never come across an occasion where deer are eating Elysium. Uh, and we have several of them because of, because of that, because we know how big a deer problem is. Um, this is one of the newer variegated ones. This is one called Southern Star. What I like about this, in addition to the variegated leaves, and this this is all last year's foliage. It's just leafing out. So it's going to have beautiful new foliage shortly. But they're evergreen plants. They got this variegated foliage, all lovely. Um, most of the older variegated Elysium, the flowers are kind of a, a white tinged with pink. They all seem to be that way. There seems to be some kind of genetic connection. Uh, but this one has the, the nice burgundy flowers, uh, the, the strappy petaled um, burgundy flowers. And there are pictures online for a lot of these, uh, most of these plants on our, on our website and in the plant catalog. So really exciting with that one. Another exciting plant, this is Elysium moonbeam. And uh, you're not going to find much information about this. This is a brand new one. Uh, Elysium typically have either red, red burgundy flowers or white flowers, the ones we grow, our native ones and the Asian ones that we have. But there is a class of Asian uh, Elysiums that have yellow flowers and not much has been done with them, even though they're great plants. So this one, Elysium moonbeam, is hybrid with um, one of the yellow flowered species. And if I had one of the white flowered one, you would see what a difference this is between this uh, flower color and a uh, and white one. It's also got smaller leaves than you usually get from the ones we grow. It's a real tidy, tidy plant. Uh, we estimate, mm, the grower said he thinks six by six. I, I, I always think they say too small, so 
eight by eight, maybe. Um, but I'm really excited about this. Uh, we, we got a big one for us to, to try here because um, we have not grown this yet. But you see, that's a really nice yellow. Um, and it's just loaded with buds. And he said, the grower said it has a really good rebloom later in summer. So it blooms heavily in the spring and then reblooms well later on. And some Elysium can have a, the flowers can have a somewhat fishy mm -hmm. odor. And this one, uh, this one, I'm not smelling anything. And it still has that, um, it's called he Anish Shrub. Odor. It still has that great um, fragrance in the, in the foliage, so, which is why deer don't eat it. I, I looked a little bit yesterday. We did have a question mark for that one? It was like yeah, one of our uh, followers <laughs> has a bed of daylilies that are eaten by the deer. I'm wondering it, if those would be a I good site like, to oh, put in it uh, for a full sun area. I, I'm sorry, there's somebody somebody else talking, and so I was hearing okay. two things at once. Who do you want to go with? Go with you. Okay, uh, we have someone in the chat that has a bed full of daylilies that are eaten all the time, and would like to know if the Elysium may be a good plant in that one with full sun. Yeah, the Elysium could go right in there in full sun. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I always think of putting, I, I like Elysium mostly in part shade. They'll grow in full sun, but they tend to uh, kind of the, the green kind of yellows out a lot. But the grower specifically mentioned that this was great in full sun. And that's because of that Elysium Simonsii uh, parentage in there. So yes, in full sun. And when the deer come and eat your Elysium, they'll completely ignore, I mean, come, come and eat your daylilies, they'll ignore the Elysium. And that's Carolyn in the chat that's unmuted herself. Carolyn, did you have a question? Uh, no, I'm fine. Okay. Okay. Let me talk about a couple of trees. We love Styrax here. Uh, and one of the, the groups that we like are the weeping um, and the pink flowered ones. And we've grown several of those over the years. Uh, this is one called Marley's Pink Parasol. It's, it's pretty much considered the, the industry standard, the, the top at this point anyway, of any of the weeping pink um, Japanese snowbell Styrax. So again, these are nice big plants. It's, you know, I'm six and a half feet tall. So it's, you know, it's as tall as me or taller, uh, but, but great um, form. So it, it cascades over, uh, it'll start leafing out. And then um, if you look, I don't know if you can see this, but it's forming the flower buds right now. So it just loads itself with flower buds. Now, this whole group, um, the pink in the flower tends to uh, be associated with the temperatures. So the cooler it is when it's, in, when it's coming into flower, the pinker it'll be. If we have a blazing hot spring, sometimes when it flowers, it's very, very pale pink. In an ideal spring, it's a really, um, a really beautiful soft pastel pink, but pink, pink. But this Marley's pink parasol, I've never seen it where it didn't look, well, you couldn't tell it was a pink one. I've seen some unnamed pink ones that were pretty white when it was uh, a, a hot summer, a hot spring. But I mean, this is, these are great size plants. Uh, these would be pretty exciting to get into the landscape. And I'm, I'm, I've just planted a nice weeping plant in front of a big window, except for my light sweeping plants this big. And now I'm like, oh, but if mm -hmm. I had Marley's pink parasol there, I need to just put them in pots and kind of rotate through, uh, you know, which whatever they're showing their, their, their stuff. Oh, I'm going to go back and forth between shrubs and trees. All right, some rhododendron. I know when people hear rhododendron, they say we don't grow rhododendron in the south. They would grow up north, and that's not true. We can grow these evergreen rhododendron. There's, there's some groups that do better for us than others. Uh, one of those are the, the so-called yak types. Uh, 
their their cultivars or hybrids with rhododendron degronianum subspecies yakushimanum so yak uh rhododendrons uh, yakushima is an island uh in japan that's pretty far south and a lot of plants from there grow really well there are some other related things like pachysanthum and morii uh that that are also do well for us so the yak rhododendrons tend to be pretty low compact plants um depending on the type, three to six feet tall and as wide or a little bit wider, um, kind of depends. But when the new foliage comes out, it will have either this really luscious, soft, velvety, um, uh, kind of tan, rusty tan backside or silver, almost always. And so it's beautiful even before it flowers when it comes out like this. And then it'll have your typical rhododendron flowers, big trusses of mostly white to fairly pale pink um, in there. So we've got a selection of these, uh, not in large numbers because they tend to be expensive. Uh, they take a long time to propagate. I love these. I grow a bunch of them at my house. Uh, just because I think they're they're so neat. I love them. If even if they never flowered, I love the foliage, uh, the new growth and and the older growth. Um, I think they're just beautiful. Like most other rhododendron, you do want to put them in uh, some shade, um, moist, well drained, acidic soil. So all the ones we have in our our list are all uh, yak hybrids. All of our evergreen ones uh, like this. We all. They're, they're all yak hybrids um, and really, I think, outstanding plants. If you're, if you're planting them into our heavy clay, plant them high. I like to plant them on a slope, uh, you, know, uh, you know, somewhere kind of up high on the slope, a little bit high. And that way they'd never sit with water around the roots. That's what kills them. So if you have raised beds or anything like that, that works great as well. The other group of rhododendron that we have are the deciduous azaleas. We have um, several different deciduous azaleas. This is one called Northern Highlights. Uh, it comes out, it flowers before any of the leaves. All these big fat buds will open up to uh, white flowers with a really nice uh, yellow gold throat. Super fragrant. Uh, most of these are these deciduous um, Azaleas are hybrids with our own native azaleas. Um, we have a lot of uh, deciduous native azaleas. You can bring in some of the, the European um, in there, but but we don't much. It's most it's mostly just our native ones. So this is one called Northern Highlights. Really um, cold hardy, easy, beautiful plant, uh, and they're starting. The deciduous azaleas are starting to flower in our lath house but they'll, um, it'll keep going for another month with them, them flowering, uh, the different ones we have. We also have another one called Mandarin Lights, which is just bright, bright orange. Um, I, I really like that plant. But the, these are two plants that I like to grow a lot personally. I like to grow everything personally. Who am I kidding? The questions? None. None. Okay. And they don't have to be about these plants. They can be about anything in our plant sale or anything else. Remember, we have well, we have a I lot have a of question. photos on online. Um, all our descriptions have the plant size, like what container size it is. So if we have a picture of a great big huge plant, look at the container size because we could sell a great big tree in a little tiny pot. So <laughs> make sure you look at that. And again, we can't ship plants. To the um, uh, let's see, we'll do a couple of herbaceous plants. Mark, all right, this is do, yes. the, azale do the azaleas have a scent? The deciduous um, ones that are the deciduous are azaleas, most of them do have a really nice fragrance. I won't, I, I don't know about mandarin uh, lights. I'm, I'm looking at Tim, he's behind me, he's kind of he's saying, Yeah. Yeah, the the more I don't see it yeah there's a mandarin right mandarin lights right behind me it's just not in flower yet um the the real bright orange ones which is what mandarin lights are they their parentage is less fragrant pardon yeah hummingbirds would love it um for sure northern highlights i know is fragrant that's a that's a really nice fragrant one 
These aren't Exbury crosses, are they, Mark? Um, those two I mentioned are not Exbury crosses. Um, Good. I'm trying to think. We might have some home home bush in there. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Okay. A plant that I always say we should grow more of is penstemon. This is a uh, penstemon is only found in North America, uh, but years it was only the europeans who did any breeding with it and who introduced them all so we had to bring them all back in from europe uh we've got a couple in the sale this is one called miniature bells it makes these spikes of of small little flowers think uh like small foxglove flowers are kind of how what uh, a lot most of the penstemon look like this is uh, a, a really nice uh, clear pink, uh, kind of fuchsia pink with a white throat and miniature bells. They can range pensamins from white to, to pink to red, to orange, blue, um, a lot of them. But they're they're really great plants. Most, most want sun and fairly well-drained soils. They tend to be western plants, mountains, um, things like that. There are, we do have some native ones. There are some ones that uh, that are more woodland type plants, but the ones we have in the sale are more for sunny spots but really easy, good plan. Mark, we had a question in the chat. Someone was wondering if the deciduous azaleas are sometimes called Confederate azaleas. I've not heard that myself. Confederate azaleas? Yeah. I have heard that, um, but not, boy, it's been a long time since <laughs> I heard that. Whoever asked that must be from like Georgia or something, because that's where I heard it was when I was working in Atlanta. Uh, but yeah, they're, they're Southern. Many of these are Southern uh, from Southern species. So they, they range. I mean, we've got a ton of them in North Carolina, give it another, what, a month or so and go out to um, Western North Carolina, go up on some of the, the balds. Uh, they're just covered in these deciduous azaleas, nice. just whole swarms of hybrids up there. So I do one grass. Um, people are always reluctant to buy grasses. I'm not sure why. This is a uh, Calamagrostis, one of our native plants. Uh, this is one called Avalanche Lightning Strike. So, Lightning Strike, feather reed grass. And it is a nicely variegated grass, got a little um, creamy white strip to the leaf. Uh, it's a, it's a native hybrid stands up really nice. Um, good plant. You know, if you like the variegated miscanthus and things, and you don't want to grow those cause they can seed around, uh, you know, this is a great alternative. It, you know, you get a nice textural contrast with other plants, easy to grow. Uh, and it's another one deer just stay away from ornamental grasses. So uh, that's a, a great reason to grow a lot of these. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Are people still wanting more? I've got more plants I can talk about. Oops. Yes, no? Say yes or no in the chat if you want more, Mark. If you can go. Hey, Mark. Feedback. What was the name of that grass? You need to, you need to run that your is speaker down to nothing. Frostus, lightning strike, feather reed grass. You mean it's your speaker to nothing? So we have we had one vote for more and no votes for none. Uh, all right, I'll do a I'll do a few more. Okay, I got some. I guess big we can do both on a little bit better than the little stuff. Doesn't matter. Uh, I'm going to turn another off native and plant ask him. that is way underutilized. Um, this is uh, Perkins Pink Yellowwood. Yellowwood's a native tree, makes uh, for a real nice um, plant, beautiful habit, especially if it's grown out in the open. And in kind of latish, mid to late spring, uh, after the leaves have come out, it has these gorgeous, just icicle white panicles hanging down from it. Um, it is one of those plants that you don't see very often, but I do pretty much every year, I'll get a picture or two sent to me with, what is this? And when I'll tell people, they, they're like, why don't I know this plant? I should know this plant. It's fantastic. Um, 
this is a pink form, nice soft pink called Perkins pink. So instead of the white panicles, you have these, these um, pink uh, little drooping icicles of, of uh, kind of pea-like flowers. The reason you don't see it very often is because as a young plant, it tends to be very awkward. It doesn't branch really well. It doesn't. So people look at it in the nursery and they're like, eh, I don't know, you know, uh, a maple this size would have kind of this nice head to it and everything, but uh, people aren't giving it a chance because once it you get it out and you get it into the landscape and get it growing, it is just spectacular. Uh, it really is. So I, I can't speak highly enough of this. I don't, I've known quite a few uh, really great plants people uh, who, you know, when they had a, an open spot, they wanted a tree. They wanted something that was going to be a real specimen. Yellow wood was the plant they put in there. And I'm thinking two people in particular recently have told me that. One, uh, Andrew Bunting, from uh, the, who's the director of horticulture for the Pennsylvania Horticulture Society. That was the plant he had put in. And locally, there's a great um, landscape architect, uh, Jeff Evans. He had a big tree come down. And you know he thought for a long time about what he was mm -hmm. going to replace that tree with. And what he went with was uh, yellow wood. And it, it's a great plant. It's awkward when it's young and it doesn't flower until after people have stopped buying plants at the nurseries uh, in the spring. So it misses out on the audience when it actually has flowers on it. So, so you probably please. answered it because you said they're not, they're awkward when they're young. Someone wants to know if there's any chance of getting them in a smaller container because they can't handle seven gallon. No. Um, they're grafted plants, and I've just never seen people selling small plants of it. So um, we don't graft them in house. And you're going to conifer. Someone was hoping for some conifers. Conifer. Okay, I got conifers pies. behind me. Okay, I have two forms of one of the most uh, widespread conifers. These are both junipers. These are both common junipers. Juniperus communis. Um, which can grow in a lot of different forms. So this first one is one that I really like uh, because I'm not a very good garden designer and I can take this plant and put it in uh, in areas and, and look like I know what I'm doing. This is one called gold cone and it makes a really nice, narrow, upright plant. New growth is kind of this chartreuse yellow. It is not bright yellow like some conifers. It's It's more of a... Uh, chartreuse to lime green. Um, as it ages, as the needles age, they get a little bit more of a bluish cast to it. So it actually, um, by by late summer and into winter, is a little more blue than yellow. But it's great for a, uh, you know, a, a putting an exclamation point in, drawing people's attention. You know, if you look at your bed and it all looks like it's low and rounded plants and things, and you want something that's going to set off those other plants, you know, something like this that goes upright is, is a great plant. So gold cone, common juniper. And they want sun and relatively well-drained soil. They don't love heavy uh, soils. And then this, this is a young plant, but this is one called a uh, spotty spreader. And uh, it makes basically a, a, a tall ground cover of kind of blue green foliage interspersed with this creamy white and it doesn't revert much it it keeps going very well um locally john monroe who uh owned architectural trees but uh, we're specializing in in conifers uh he told me about this plant he loved it and actually if you go on our website and look there's a really great picture of one that's from john monroe uh I haven't hadn't grown it before, but he he said it was a really easy, really good plant for him. Um, he grew it kind of he kind of staked his upwards and then let it spread out, and so it was kind of a low shrub. But I've also seen it where it's much more of a ground cover, about a twelve inch tall kind of creeping ground cover with this. Um, it looks almost sun dappled, uh, even when there's no shade to dapple it. Questions about any of the other conifers in our list that people had? No questions. Okay. 
Well, I'll point out a few last things. I'm, I'm just about out of, out of um, plants to talk about up here. This is an Amelanchier, Amelanchier X grandiflora. So this is a, a, a hybrid um, service berry. Um, it's a native, uh, hybrid native plant. Um, I, you know, I didn't realize how many natives I brought up. I wasn't intentional, mm -hmm. but this is one called Autumn Brilliance. And I learned they were called service berries. I don't know if this is true, but I, I learned that they, um, they flower in the spring. And when they flower, that means that the ground has thawed enough that you can have funeral services. Going back way back when, when you couldn't dig when the ground was frozen up farther north. They, grow, they have a wide range. So that's obviously much wider north. I, I don't know if that's true. So uh, this is in the rose family. So it has nice big white flowers. Amelanchier grandiflora, grand large flowers. Uh, really beautiful flowers, followed by red fruits that birds absolutely love. And then this particular uh, selection is called Autumn Brilliance because it tends to have very good fall color, nice um, uh, reds mostly in the, the fall color. Easy to grow, sun to part shade, uh, great for kind of, you know, in those uh, woodland edges and things like that. Uh, you know, it kind of crosses that line between having that native natural look, but a little showier than you usually get out in the, the woods. So I really like that. And if you like birds, this is a great plant to add. All right, getting down to the end. We did just have a question mark in yeah. the chat. Uh, Chris was saying she's a little bit worried about the pawpaw and its shrub or its spreading habit. Should she be worried about that? Is it really going to? Is it no. going to make some? No. So the pawpaw that we we had in the um, the sale, I believe it may be sold out already. It's a uh, it's a southern native. It's not our native tree pawpaw. It's a shrubby one. Um, the small flower pawpaw, and it will, it'll can form little colonies and things, but won't spread, you know, it's think of like a, uh, IT, a sweet, uh, sweet spire or something like that. So it can, it can suck around, but not, not to where it's going to take over. It'll just make a little, a little patch. And Annabelle just commented that her autumn brilliance has never flowered. Is it in too much shade? Probably too much shade. Too tall? Okay. No. Four. That okay, this is kind of a neat little plant. Um, you might be familiar with Zelkova serrata, which is a large tree by, uh, related to elms. They're really good, easy trees. Uh, often get pretty good fall color, although not always here, but often have kind of a dusky purpley and maroon and um, some other colors in there. When they're good, they're great. Um, other years, they're just so-so. This is a genetic dwarf um, that is grafted and makes a small tree. So this is not going to have showy flowers, um, but it will have beautiful foliage, make a nice little tree, great for growing in a container, growing as a little bonsai, just getting a little bit of different texture in the garden. It's called goblin. Zelkova goblin. And I love these little smaller versions of big trees. I've got little tiny lindens and Zelkovas and uh, elms and things like that. So if you grow like a lot of dwarf conifers, you know, this is a great companion for that, like you would with, uh, you know, some of the dwarf elms. Uh, great for just adding some height and some texture in, in garden. You can grow into part shade. I wouldn't go into heavy shade with it, but um, should be a pretty easy to grow, tough plant. All right, this is it. I really did not think I was gonna talk about all of them, but here you go. As someone said in the chat, Mark talks, we listen. Uh, all right, well, I'll do it, yeah. So we have two different taxodium, bald cypress. We've got a uh, green, green whisper, green whisper. Uh, which is an uh, upright grower, really um, soft foliaged one, really billowy, um, will get to be a big, big plant. Again, bald cypress native, uh, 
plant to here. They grow in uh, wet soils, but it will also grow in really dry, compacted soils. Um, they, they are amazingly uh, resilient that way. This other one is one called Jim's Little Guy. It's a, uh, a compact form. Now, it'll get bigger than most of the, the literature tells you, but still very, very compact. These are probably pretty close to the same age. And, you know, you can see that quite a bit of difference in, in growth habit and growth height. Um, but this will be, a, you know, a nice little kind of cone of, of this uh, soft green feathery foliage as well. In the fall, both of them, the foliage will turn russet. Uh, which is the more expensive um, brown or orange. Mm -hmm. Russet. Does that sound lovely? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, does, it really does turn that into a really nice coppery color that, that uh, bald cypress do. And then it'll drop all the needles. And so you have, uh, you know, a nice open uh, structured plant. I love growing, um, once they get a little bit bigger, growing uh, our native Carolina jessamine, the uh, gelsemium uh, sempervirens through here, that evergreen uh, vine that's flowering right now with bright gold flowers because uh, it'll be flowering before this leaves out usually. So you'll get this gold all the way up through a tree and then a leaf out and uh, you don't really notice the gelsemium so much after that. I think that's great. Shouldn't do that on this dwarf one though. But these are both really fun um, plants. I, um, I, for some reason, I managed to get a mostly woody plants up here that wasn't intentional. I was just uh, talking about plants that I was kind of really interested in. Um, but we've got everything from some tropical things to stick in your garden uh, for the season to be really showy, to herbaceous perennials, to trees and shrubs and vines, a little bit of everything. Uh, we, um, we will be adding more to the plant sale. Uh, we'll We've gotten some more things in that we can um, put in the plant sale. Uh, probably starting tomorrow, there'll be more things in the plant sale. So uh, check back often for what we have. Uh, photos on there. Again, this is only for local pickup. We cannot ship the plants. I know we, some of you may, who are farther away, may have had plant, we may have shipped plants to you when we have an auction or something. But when we have an auction, we have maybe a couple hundred plants total. For this sale, we've got over 300 different types of plants, you know, over 6,000 plants total. If we were to open that up for shipping, um, we, we wouldn't be able to do any gardening. <laughs> so happy to answer any last questions. And, and you're always welcome, if you're shopping, you're always welcome to email us. You can email uh, jcra-events at ncsu.edu with your question, and it'll show up, uh, it'll get forwarded on to myself or to Tim Alderton or to Doug Ruin or Dennis Carey or somebody in our, our horticulture staff to answer the question. No questions in the chat, Mark. All right. Sounds like it's time to sign off. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. All. Sorry for the rough start, but we had a good tour with Doug and a great conclusion with the plant sale discussion with Mark. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>